Hey. How's everybody doing? A little bit of a preview of today. So if you have your Bibles, it's going to be in 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 9. Chapter 9. So I'm not going to, uh, you know, there's, there's German co- chocolate cake waiting on me. So I got about 40 minutes of material today, maybe. But I got to be honest with you. I, right out of the shoot, I'm just going to be honest. This, this might be the hardest sermon I've ever done. I'll be honest with you. And you'll understand in a few seconds, but, you know, um, I've put this sermon off for three and a half years. And because of progressive sanctification and where it lands, you know, this is, next week we'll start Advent. We'll start Christmas. We'll do Christmas on the 22nd, and then on the 24th, Christmas Eve, we'll have a service at 3 o'clock, right? So make sure you're here. Last, last year when you had 10 people here for Christmas Eve. So I want to make sure we have a lot of people here. Bring your friends. We'll talk about the gospel. We'll get it going. We'll have a good time. We'll have a candlelight service. We'll have communion um, at 3 o'clock on, on, Christmas Eve, on Christmas Eve. So, But today, today is about sanctification. So this is our sixth week in, in, in sanctification. So when I came to Apex, I was 41 years old. And, and I, you know, I had no pastoral experience I, you know, I spoke in front of a lot of groups at work and things like that, and um, I wasn't a, a seminary-educated person. Um, I do have college degrees, but I don't have, uh, um, I, you know, I, I, I'm committed to this place, and I hope that you are too. And, and I feel like that God's begotten, right, begotten me to here, and I think a lot of you understand that. You've been here for a long time, and that we have been called to this place for our lives. So... I just, throughout the day, you know, I, I got to be honest with you, I was having nightmares about this last night. And, you, and you're going to go, why? In a minute, but that's okay. But um, I feel like I was called to this place. And, and God has led me to see that, um, you know, I think, I, I think there's a need that I got to raise money for a jet. I got to have a jet airplane. <laughs> the God, I got to. I mean, I, there's no way around it. I've, I've been, I mean, I, I got to have it. I think that, um, you know, that's where, God, we got to raise $64 million is what it's going to cost for a jet airplane. Oh, oh, wait a minute. That's these guys. That's what these guys want. They all have jets? No, almost all of them do, really. Um, you know, one guy, uh, TJ uh, Jakes, you guys heard of him? Yeah, he said he needed $67 million dollars. For a jet airplane, and he wanted you to provide that money for him. Then you know they did. You know, this is a group of what I call false prophets. And in the in the areas that I've been, and and I, and I could, let me just see if I can pick a couple of them. I think Joyce Myers is up there. Big Joyce Myers, right? All right. Joyce Myers believed that Jesus went to hell after he was crucified. Joyce Myers also believes that you are a God, little g. Did you know that? That is blasphemy. She teaches that. So does Kenneth Copeland. Um, Jesse Duplantis is up there somewhere, I believe. Um, You guys heard of Jesse Duplantis? How about Kenneth Copeland? You heard of Kenneth Copeland? Kenneth Copeland has six jet planes and a $14 million house. Now, that's a lot smaller than, you know, our boy Joel, that's a lot smaller in his house, right? But, I, you, know, it's, the, you know, these guys up here, I don't need a jet plane, by the way. Um, I've got a, uh, well, we'll t- I got an Accord. That's good enough. So, so when I came here, I had a lot of venom towards organized religion. This is organized religion, right? Um, specifically, the church kind of organized religion. And, and you can see from the picture behind me that there's a plethora of individuals that are considered by the, by the Reformed commun- community as false prophets. And all these guys, you can just Google it or ask me. And I'll, I've got tons and tons of research I've done through the years on these guys. They're blasphemers, like, like me or not, right? But in all that, there's certain subjects I've always refused to, to preach on, right? And... Uh, one of those subjects is money. One of those subjects is generosity of the church. And I've always refused it. And 
and mainly because, you know, I didn't want my face up there on one of these memes like with these guys, right? And I, I wish I could have inserted my, my head right there and, and did that. I know, it, I know somebody's going, yeah, it would have took up most of the space, but that's okay. Cause I have a, <laughs> but that's okay, right? But, you know, mainly for that, but also because it's been my experience that a bulk of churches is that what they want to spend money on is silly, right? I mean, they want to spend, they, you know, it's just silly because they want to make people comfortable, right? Are you comfortable in the chair you're in today? That's not that. It's not bad, you know? It's not bad for what it is. It's not the best. I get it, right? And it, it could be. You're right. It could be worse. And, and, you know, everybody in these churches, they, you know, they want a reclining seat. You've been to the movies now with the reclining seats yet? All right? Great. And now, the last time I went, I had a tray that came over, right? You know, that's what we're working towards here instead of the jets, right? We'll do that. You know, and they've got lumbar massages in the back, and then you just hit a button, and all of a sudden a cup pops down in your cup holder, and an espresso jumps in, you know? That's what they're after, I think, you know? And, it, you know, through my travels, and I've traveled around the world, and I've seen a lot of this, and I've seen a lot of pain, a lot of darkness in the world, and I just couldn't stomach some of this, and, and it didn't make sense to me. And, you know, I just didn't want to touch this subject at all. And, and, and really, it's, just, it's about Christians being generous. And this is a time of year that we are generous, right? You know, I felt dirty about mentioning money. I did. I really did. And, and you know, because I didn't want to turn off somebody that was a de churched person, right? And, and, or an unbeliever. Because the unbeliever has, you know, they see all these clowns that are on television, right, asking for please send me uh, Revelations, you know, 2964 says, send me a $29.64 uh, offering, right? That's the clown in Columbus that does that all the time. He uses Isaiah, you know, he, go in, he won't go in like chapter 1, verse 2, and say, send me a dollar two, right? He goes into Isaiah 66, verse 12, and says, send me a $66.12 offering, and all these people around the world send it to him, and you'll be healed, right? And, you know, I just you feel like you, you, you got to be delivered and you feel robbed sometimes, so I avoided the subject. You know, but about three and a half years ago, God began to heal my heart. And I, and I began to see um, that by avoiding this topic and avoiding some of the other subjects that I've kind of went through here in the last year, that I was kind of sinning against you guys. And that's what I wanted to avoid. I wanted to avoid topics, and especially this one, and I was robbing you from what is a biblical indicator of your spiritual health, which is unbelievably valuable to you. And you'll see why when we get through. But here's what I mean by it. In certain contexts, you'll, and you don't really have to look in your wallet, right? And if some places around the world, you don't have to look in your wallet to judge whether you're a Christian. You get that, right? Because in, in some places like China and North, North Korea and those places, you know, it, it, people hate you if you're a Christian. And if you claim to be a Christian, you're taking it pretty serious there. Because you're going to die. You get that they know they're going to die. And, 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 and you know, it's kind of like, if you're murdered for Jesus, right, or you know you're going to be murdered for Jesus, and you still got that I Heart Jesus t-shirt on, right, then you're in. Because that's brave. That's boldness for Christ. It, you know, and, and if, you know if, if, that's, if that's what it is, you know, and, and, but see, in our context, the line between intellectual knowledge and a life transformed. That is, and, and that's the most non-existent that I see. Because it's here to here. And we've talked about this all the time. And, and in our culture, everybody knows, but there are very few people who live and walk in this. So in the cultural environment, I mean, you, you know, how you spend your money, especially in the U.S., especially in the U.S., is just an unbelievable indicator of what your spiritual health is and really according to the scriptures. So if you haven't figured it out, I'm going to talk about money a little bit today. But really, it's about generosity. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about it according to the scriptures, and I'm going to talk about, you know, listen, I'm not taking out special offering. I'm not doing it. I don't accept any money at this, from this church. I take no salary. Mike takes no salary. Josh takes no salary. We do it because we love Jesus. That's it. We don't do it for any other reason, right? I'm not taking a, you know, I, I drive an Accord, an 18 Accord, and it doesn't backfire when I go through school, drum, school zones, praise the Lord, so nobody thinks I'm firing a gun, right? And, and it has cloth seats. There's nothing special about it. And, you know, this is not, 
big gift Sunday, okay? We're not doing that. It, this is not lay your first fruits at the altar. Again, two more from these guys. So it right out of their page. We're not doing that. Listen, I'm not making an appeal for your money. Keep your money in your wallet. Keep your money in your purse. I don't want your money. I don't even know how much you give. I don't care how much you'll give, and you'll understand why in a minute. I really don't care. I'm after your heart. That's what I'm after. I'm after your heart. Because the Bible's going to say that your wallet can call you a liar, right, before anyone else will, because it's going to jump right out. And this is pleading with you over the state of your soul. Now, how you spend your money and how you see your money is going to really reveal what true value and what you actually worship. You're going to see that. And, and so that takes us kind of to 2 Corinthians 9. And, and what you're going to see is, is that we're going to see why the Christian is generous. And that's the biblical language. So the text is going to operate under the assumption that anyone who was born again, if you're born again in here, anyone who has been sealed by the Holy Spirit, anyone who's been given faith by the Holy Spirit, anyone who's been awakened by the grace and mercy of God to the reality of God and His Son who died for you is going to be generous. So it's going to unpack why we're generous and it's, and it's going to move on from there and explain what happens when we're generous. That's, that's all it's going to do. And, and, and we're, we're, I'm going to make an appeal to those of you who are not generous in here who say you're a Christian. That's it. So but before we get there, I want to read a couple of verses. So if you have, if, keep your thumb there if you have your Bible in, in 2 Corinthians 9. And we're going to look at uh, just four verses real quick. And the first one is Ecclesiastes 5.10. And, and she'll put them up on the board. It says this. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money. Think about that. Nor he who loves wealth with his income, this is also vanity. Remember when we went through Ecclesiastes, we went through the whole book, word for word, and, and what does vanity mean? It means meaningless. So he who chases money as an ultimate thing will have a meaningless life. That's what Solomon's telling you. So although it doesn't mention the spirit, soul, or emotions, it's fundamental in the text that if you are pursuing money as the answer of whatever is in your life, emotional, spirit, qualms are, whatever, you know, and you're trying to solve it with money, it's not the answer. And you're never going to have enough money to satisfy you. That's what's, I mean, Solomon had more money than anybody ever, right? Makes Donald Trump look like one of us. Matthew 6, 24 says this. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. This is a very simple text. Because here's what happens. Here's what these guys say. Well, they, what they, those guys that were up there, this is what they say. They say, I need all this money to serve God. Give it to me. Put it in the offering. Put it in the coffins. I need it all to serve God. And it's just kind of breaking down the idea that you can't serve both because ultimately what happens with them, and they're doing it, I mean, go, look, go Google Joe Olstein's car. It's a Bacotti. It's like a million, $2 million car. That's what he needs to drive around in, right? And, 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 and you know, ultimately it's going to betray them, and I think it's already showing, and you have to serve one or the other, either God or money. So 1 Timothy 6.10 for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. We like to quote that one. And it's, it's through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. The next one is Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Did you guys know all these verses were in there about money? There's dozens more. Jesus speaks about it. only thing he speaks about more is what? Hell. That's it. So... It, it, Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Keep your life tree from the love of money. Life free, life tree. Life from the love of money. And be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you or, nor forsake you. He said he won't leave you or forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. For what can man do to me? That's the protection you get as a Christian. So from these four verses, and there's dozens of others we talked about, and how it's going it's, you know, it's to link to the soul how you view and use your money. So, so many, many, you know, 
you know, I would say that deep, significant spiritual growth into the fullness of what God has for us in Christ is impossible until you deal with this. And that's where I think I sinned against you. Because we should have dealt with this a long time ago and then been done instead of doing it around Christmas, right? And, and how you see it, how you understand it, how you use it, how you lay your money at the feet of Christ, it's very important. So until we align our money with Jesus, until it's aligned with him, we would, would not be able to continue with our progressive sanctification. It just kind of stalls us in that. So the Christian is generous, and, and some pretty, pretty mighty things come out of that. All right, so let's go to 2 Corinthians 9, 6. 2 Corinthians, we're going to be in verse 6. The point is this. Straight out, Paul says, the point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly, or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So right out of the gate, he's unpacking why we're generous. We're we're not generous under compulsion or being reluctant, right? It's it's, It's not that I do this because God is going to destroy me, or out of begrudging heart do we give things. We don't do it that way. So God... God will be good to me. The heart, the heart, is, trans, the, the heart is transformed. A mature believer in Jesus Christ will not go, well, I better make God happy. Here's my 10%. Leave me alone. And I can prove to you that 10% is wrong. It's, it's a tax in the Old Testament that somebody uses as a base. But we're not going to go there today. And, and I'm reading on, it says, and God is able to make all grace abound in you. So that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. So it's not your pastor telling you that you better give or, you, you, know, you know, I better give or God's going to kill me. The motive of what we're doing is not begrudging submission. It's not compulsion. And it's, it's, that, it's not that the heart, it's the heart by which we are generous. Instead, it's a transformation of the soul from the grace and mercy of God freely lavished upon us by Jesus Christ. Think about that. We give because of the freely lavished mercy and grace from Jesus Christ. And we become a recipient of, free, of the free gift of salvation. And we've also been you know, dealt with by God graciously. How many sins has God forgiven you that, that you don't even know about? Because when he saved you, he took them all away. And, and we begin to deal graciously with others also. And, and as, the, you know, as we ex- experience the generosity of God, we, we become more generous ourselves. And that's what it's about. And, and you see, this is a fundamental Christian message that gets hijacked all the time because it becomes give me, give me, give me for the pastor. And, and I don't want your money. And here, here, here's what it is. It, it, you were purchased by God, for God, through no merit of your own. None whatsoever. We we did not earn our salvation. We did not buy our salvation. We did not do these 14 steps to earn the favor of God. He has freely and cleanly justified us while we're at our worst. And that's the gospel. When we were at our worst, he saved us. And, and that's the gospel message. And you, you, couldn't, you couldn't save yourself, and he did. And at, you know, at your best, your works are filthy rags to a holy God. But while you were a sinner, I always love to say this, Christ died for you. And he, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And we have been freely given salvation so we freely give and the basis of our generosity comes down to the basis of christianity which is the cross it's no it's not an it's not an outside in religion it, it's 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 not let me appease god with a sacrifice it, it's a transformed heart so then we see a line being drawn between the two that we we have experienced Free grace and mercy of God and, and those who go to church and, and, and then the line shows those that, you know, all that free mercy and all that free grace and then the, over here you have people who want to follow the moral rules. 
So one has a heart that says, you know, I've been freely given, I've been freely living, and I'm open-handed. I live open-handedly. And those who go to church and say, I'll give this to God and he'll leave me alone. You know, here's your 10%. Now get out of my face or worse, you know, nothing, you know, and we just take from others and not give. And, and that's a clear line. And we'll talk about, we'll talk about the giving part. And, and we don't give reluctantly, though. We don't give with compulsion. You know, we give, as, we give to God and we say, God, this is, this should, I hope this is a, a sweet-smelling offering to you that I give to you. It's yours anyway. So the, the generosity springs from generosity that has been shown by God and Jesus Christ on his cross. So that's really the bedrock of our foundation. Let's look at verse 10. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. So here's what he's saying. Is this bread yours? Where did you get that bread? Well, I planted some seed, and I grew some weeds, and I made some bread. Okay, where would you get the seed? Who gave you the seed? Let's, all right, let's do it this way. Let's do it this way. The foundation of, Christi, of, Christi, of the Christianity and the generosity is the cross of Jesus Christ. The foundation leads to an understanding that we have and everything that exists. Follow me here, because you've got to understand, this is a big point, that everything we have and everything that exists is God's. That's the foundation of the cross. So we don't buy into this myth of ownership. We don't own it, but rather we see ourselves as stewards. So we don't perceive our, you know, ourselves to have won anything, but instead we become stewards. So we're stewarding what God is giving us. So we don't perceive ourselves to, to win, but, you know, and it's everything. It's, it's not ours. It's his, and it's been given to us for his purpose. And that's where we go wrong. So then the cross of Christ leads to, you know, if you think about it, if, if you know, think about it this way. If you're great at business, if you're great at something, think about what you do great. It, it, where did that come from? Where did it come from? I mean, if, if you went to college to do something, you got to admit, there was other people there that got better grades than you and, and, and did it did a great job in school, right? But they were terrible at business. But where did that come from from you? Or, or maybe you're good at arts and crafts, I, I mean, or, or those kind of things. I, I mean, it, where, where did it come from? Well, you know, I worked at that, right? I, I worked at that. I'm a great painter. Bro, I can work at painting for the rest of my life, but it looks like I had a seizure on the canvas, right? It's not going to be I mean, it's just going to look like some abstract art from whatever that guy's name was that used to draw the eyeballs on the sides and stuff. I don't have that aptitude, right? I don't have that aptitude. But where did it come from? All that you have is God's. Everything. Not the 10%. Everything. Everything. All right. Do it this way. Don't believe me? One more. Do it this way. Everything we have is God's. And to view anything as, as if it's your possession alone is a, is a break in reality to God, right? So for the record, right, do it this way. We're trying to, you know, we don't want our kids to be this way, right? Do you get it? Right? So do this test on your way home. On your way home, stop by Walmart and buy him a PlayStation 4, right? And all the kids in here are like, yes, I love this guy. There is no kids. Okay, that's okay. Some of us are going, no. But listen, buy him a PlayStation 4. Buy him a PlayStation, let him hold it, let him carry it around the store, and, and then you pay for it, and you know, let him hold it in the car on the way home. Think about this, right? And then let him sit on their lap, let him touch it, let him dream. Right, and then you, you get to your house, and the and in that house that you own, right? You own it. You get to the house and you own it, and and you allow your kid to live in the one you just bought the PlayStation Four for, right? You know, hook it up to your TV, right? And and get them playing, and then go out of the room and make you a sandwich and eat you a sandwich, and then walk in and say, "Hey, can Daddy get a turn?" What are they going to say? Nope. 
You bought That's mine. Wait a minute. 30 minutes ago, I just bought this for you. You bought it for me. That's mine. You bought it for me. Yeah, yeah, I did. I bought it for you, but it's mine. It's hooked to my TV. You're in my house. You're sitting in my chair. Right? Do you get that? You know, and, and then, you know, it's time to do physical harm at that point, right? That's what we want to do. I'm just kidding. You got to train them. You got to train them. Train them up. Train it out of them. You know, no loving parent at that point just goes, oh, kids, ha, do what you want, right? Although we see it happen today. You know, you sit down, you try to explain to them and teach them and, you know, graciousness, generosity, value of sharing, right? We discipline, we shape, we mold the kids. So what happens to many of us is we become spoiled children. But what we're doing is the same thing to God. What we're doing is, you know, hey, that's mine, God. That's mine. That's mine. And, now I, now I get, and God's saying, I, no, I just got that for you. No, no, that's mine. You gave it to me. But it's mine. I, I mean, I, I gave it to you. I gave it to you for a reason. Well, I don't care about your reason. It's mine. You gave it to me. So, so the way our kids act that drives us crazy, right? That our grandkids, however you want to do it. Sorry, I should have thrown that in there, right? Uh, I mean, so the way they act is often the way we act with God. Specifically, when we think we have ownership of things, of everything. So for the believer in Christ, they... They understand that all they have is his, and it's not yours. Now, that creates an unreal amount of freedom, right? An unreal amount of freedom, because here's why. Because my accord doesn't define me. My house doesn't define me, because it's God's. I mean, if I lose the car or I keep the car, praise God. Right? If I, you know, if my, my account has tons of money in it or it doesn't have tons of money in it, praise God. That big house or small house, praise God. And when we understand that everything is his and ownership is a myth, instead we are stewards of stuff that is God's. So the gospel is the foundation, and it's understanding that we are not owners, but stewards. So let's go to verse 11. Verse 11. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. So the cross is the foundation of Christian generosity, and that moves us to stewards, not owners, not managers, um, and, and that leads us to what, what he calls here an enriched life where generosity begat generosity. So your kind act, your generosity as a Christian to other Christians and other people brings about more generosity. And the whole book of Ecclesiastes is simply the Bible unpacking that, you know, you put your hope in and pursue anything under the sun, anything in this world, you pursue that anything. You chase it. Your life's going to be meaningless. It's going to be vanity. And you can try to boil it down any way you want. You know, I love this and this and I do this. And, but, it, but in the end, it ends up being just meaningless. Think about it. I mean, and, and he has this exhaustful list of things that you can do under the sun. And he, he did everything. Everything. Think of it this way, right? Think of it this way. Let's say that you're a, a, a CEO of a fi Fortune 500 company, right? And, and, and you build all these things, and, you, and, and you know, everybody loves you at the place, right? They always fake that, right? They always love you, and, and you, you've overcome all these obstacles, and you turn the company around, and, and you made everybody money, and, and you're thriving, and you celebrate, and you have profits, and, and, and then you retire, right? Ecclesiastes says that within a couple of weeks, Nobody cares that you were ever there. 
How many of you retired? Think about it. Nobody even cares if you're ever there. I mean, the CEO that, that took your place, he's got new problems to overcome. He, he's got, uh, uh, you know, new things to celebrate, and, and none of which involve you. You're out. You retired. So a few years later, you'll die, right? And hardly anybody is going to come to your funeral. It's a chipper little book, that Ecclesiastes book. You know, you know even with money, he says, gather all the money you want. You're going to die, and you're going to leave it to your children, and even your children are stupid, right? You remember that part? And so all that you've worked so hard for, you, all that you worked for is going to be squandered by some idiot kid down the line. Maybe not this generation, maybe the next generation. And he says, what if your son's a fool? Then what? All that hard work. And, and, and if he's not a fool, then maybe his son's a fool, or maybe that son's a fool. And it just keeps going on down, right? You know, I mean, you, you, have, to, you have to be some kind of psychologist to see whether the wealth goes on to the next and the next generation. And all you have to do is watch reality TV, and you see it. You see it. And what he's going to eventually say is everything you leave, money, houses, whatever it is, gets squandered. And, and we could go over thing after thing after thing, you, you name it, whether that's the pursuit of pleasure or whether that's the pursuit of comfort or whether that's the pursuit of wealth, whether that's the pursuit of power. Ecclesiastes just knocks it down and says, in the end, it doesn't work. And no matter how rich you are, eventually there's going to come a, you know, everybody has this happen. Someday they're going to paint you up like a clown and stick you in a box and put you in the ground. Everyone. It's coming for us. And right now, it's about 30 minutes closer than it was when we started. And with the cross as our foundation, stewardship and understanding our neighbors, our time, our work, our money, all of it, all of it, neighborhood, time, work, money, all of it is under the umbrella of the reconciling work of God in the world. Until we understand that as Christians, we're going to, our progressive sanctification is going to stop. So we freely give. We open our house and we have people into it and we practice hospitality. We're good at that. Practice it more. Right? It's under that umbrella. We radically are generous because of, of, of this life isn't the end of the story. It's not the end. That's why we're radically generous. I mean, mature believers in Christ, those who have tasted the grace of Christ, are dramatically generous. And I want to show you what happens when we give. And it's, it's not about money. I keep, it's not really about money. It could be time. It could be the way you work or what you do. You know, maybe something around here. I don't know. Verse 12. For the ministry of this service is not supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgiving to God. But their approval of this service will glorify God because of your submission flowing from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others while they long for you and pray for you because there's passing grace of God upon you. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. It's very simple. And this is what happens when, we're, when Christians walk in radical generosity, a radical generous spirit, which we are commanded to walk in. Number one, this is what happens. The felt needs of people get met. Meaning that the poor people are taken care of. And some of you are going, that's me, help me. Right? That's, that's good, we should. And, and the hungry people get fed. German chocolate cake today, fellas. I'm in. If my mom made it, I'm sorry. If mom made it, it'd be, you know, we'd step it up another notch. No offense. I mean that. No offense to all five of you who made the German chocolate cake. Oh, there's only one. Oh, sorry. Maybe I'm being greedy. But listen, hungry people are fed. Sick people are taken care of. Hurting people are loved. Cold people get blankets. Coats. You know how, 
how bad I felt that we couldn't do our Christmas this year. Awful. Awful. You know how many people depended on that from us? Last year, I, th- I think somewhere around 200. But see, that doesn't include all the people that come in and help us, and we get to talk to them about Jesus, or we get to invite them to church, or the motorcycle people that run from me, right? Like, they, hey, he's coming, go. And they run. It's true. But, you know, and, and the church has excelled in this historically, right? I mean, if you... It, years ago, if you could drive downtown in Columbus, right, almost all the hospitals have what in their name? A denomination, right? Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, right? Churches founded from the beginning, hosp- they were hospital, hospitable to care for people, right? And that's, that's the things that we do. And it, but it's changed over the last decades. It's changed. I mean, hospitals have become more money makers, right, than caretakers. And that's a political thing. We're not going to talk about it, right? But See, in the end, the church has done well at being hospitable. We've done well at that here at Apex. We've done really well, I think. I mean, where, where there are hungry people, we feed them. Where there, where there are coats, we bring in coats, and, and we provided. And, I, you know, where there were school supplies. You know, we just sent a team to Haiti. You know that, right? I think it was six, seven people that went to Haiti this year, right? I mean, they went there to care for people who they know will never be able to repay them. Never. I mean, because repayment's not the goal. It's, it's, it's radical generosity. The felt needs of people are met. But can you get this in your head? Get this in your head. Within a 10-mile radius of this church, there, there are people that are living in a level of poverty that will and should disturb you. You get that. The foundation is the grace of God, and we are stewards of what God has given us, not owners. We are stewards, not owners. And we want to live the enriched life that the Bible promises us. It doesn't promise you anything but an enriched life. See, they moved, you know, so we moved from the felt needs being made to praise God. And, and if, you, if you, you know, read any secular magazine, any secular stuff on media, social media, political stuff, you know, in and you share the gospel with, with the community. And, and this is what's getting me that's happening right now, right? Apparently, there's some kind of, they think we're doing some kind of switch and bait thing, right? So one night, right, Krista was watching South Park, you know. I was in the other room fasting and praying. And, you know, and, and then until I heard it, and I was like, woman, what are you doing? Get in here and pray. <laughs> No, nah, actually, she just watches the Hallmark Channel. So, they're, you know, they're, you know, the, but this is what they're doing. They were making fun of this idea. They they were making fun of this idea. They had a picture of a turkey leg or some kind of food, and and, and you you would you would have to ask her. You know, that, you have to ask her because I wasn't watching. Um, but they said that you know, Bible plus prayer equals food. Bible plus prayer equals food. So what they were doing is they were teaching these little starving, and this is on TV, they were teaching these little starving African children this math problem, and if they got it right, they got to eat. They got to read the Bible, and they got to eat. And they were making fun of Christians, right? And this was just a jab at this idea that we share our faith while we're taking care of people. We share our faith while we're taking care of people. Why wouldn't we do that? I mean... You see, they got this atheist belief. This is, what, this is my personal atheist belief, and it's an interesting one. It says, there is no God, I really hate him. Think about that. That's what they believe. And they're, you know, it's interesting. The time that, anytime that someone is bitter and angry, and they say they don't believe in a God, but they hate him, right? And, and the argument is just so silly, and it's a silly argument. But if... if It's our belief that we can break the chains of poverty. We can break the chains of racism. We can help with injustice. We can help with oppression. But that's what the gospel destroys. 
The gospel destroys this. Wouldn't it be cruel for us to give them a blanket of food and not help them destroy the cycle? I mean, we can do all these things we want, but we can put the gospel in their hearts if we preach the gospel. That's what we're sent for. I think it would be cruel. I mean, give freely. Our giving is not predicated on, upon their belief. The Holy Spirit is the one that can lead someone to belief. You're the one that's supposed to speak it. And, and, but, but, man, we're just kind of just meeting felt needs and, and, and we're attacking core issues. And then Marion, we're saying it's, it's not okay to be a lying, corrupted, whatever. And the gospel doesn't doesn't matter, and, and, and we're saying it doesn't matter that it's that they do these things. See, the gospel sees through that and challenges things and calls people into holiness, holiness or not. So when you speak that into someone that's in that situation, see, this is what it boils down to. We're not just, we're, we're trying to bring the hope for the world. but we're really trying to bring hope for the next world. See, Jesus is the only hope. And, and if you've been around poverty, think about this. If you've been around poverty, maybe you're living, I don't know. But what happens? What's the biggest thing that happens in poverty? There, uh, hopelessness sets in. And the gospel restores hope for the present and gives hope for the future. And maybe you're skeptic in here, right? Maybe you're skeptic. Maybe you're really, you know, all right, Really, really, do you think what we want is to, is to collect a tithe? If, if we were in Haiti, are we going to collect a tithe off of, of, of that Haitian village for 27 cents and get rich and powerful off of that? If you've been to Haiti, you know, right? There's nothing. I saw a kid when I was there, he had an onion in his hand and it made his, made his life. That's all he was going to eat that day was an onion. I hate onions. I'd starve. I mean, we're going to get, I mean, uh, lovingly, if you're, if you're a skeptic, right? Do you think we're going to get rich off a of four cents tithe from some village? But that's what people think. That's the silliness that ha that's out there. I mean, you have to let the bitterness and anger take your ability to think. And if you fervently believe the gospel of Jesus Christ erodes and destroys the root problems of poverty, injustice, a lack of hope, oppression, corruption, if the gospel serves, severs that root, then we'd be fools not to provide something with the, the felt need like Jesus. So we will hand out stuff when we get the chance. We want to see people converted. We want to see people saved. We want to, because that's what the Holy Spirit fills a man's heart. He's no longer walking corruption. Think about it. He fills your heart so you can't walk in the corruption. So now it's just trying to convert him. You're not just trying to convert him to a religion, but if you, if you don't want to just check him off on a census as a Christian, we don't want to do that. We want, we want them to be converted. We want the Holy Spirit to fill their heart with faith. Transformation. But see... You even see it in here because how many are in here are just pretending to be Christians? You're pretending and you will be, find, you will be found out. You don't get to hide that forever. I mean, you don't, you don't get to come to church on weekends and pretend to be a Christian for that hour and a half, maybe 45. Pretend to be a Christian and then the rest of the time be involved in every wicked thing out there. You have not fooled God. You will not win this game. And, and, and you, you, don't, you don't hide long enough to win this one. See, going into dark places and doing th hard things and, and building clinics and giving away medical supplies, I mean, come on, that's, that's what we're supposed to be about. It's the power of God unto salvation. And the, the reality is the cycle that all these impoverished areas that you see and, and the chains that are there and the lack of hope, no hope for the present, no hope for tomorrow, that's what the gospel does. It restores it. That's why we go. That's why you go. 
The gospel restores it. And we're coming with the gospel as much as we can. We want to see the world transformed by the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you want to see that, then your radical belief in the gospel says that it may cost me my life. I'll do what God wants. I'll serve you. I'll, I'll share with, the, with you the hope for this life and the next. I'll be open-handed. I'll be countercultural. And, and if, if any, if, and, you know, if we were to shine like stars in any area of life, in any area as Christians, it would be in our generosity. Think of the people in the past. Generosity. Money doesn't control us, but we, we've been set free. My car doesn't define me. I don't have to dress a certain way. And at the end, the gospel, it sets us free. So many of us, right, the fears, the weight, the complexity of life that we have, it, it goes back to this idea of money. We make that the central thing of getting more, of chasing God's stuff and not him. And then it goes back to how I want people to perceive me. The gospel can set you free from that. You don't have to walk in that. You don't have to walk in fear and, and wait because of money. And since you don't have to, you know, you don't have to have this kind of car, this kind of whatever, this house, this kind of look, it'll set you free. Maybe you're a bottom, may, I get it, maybe you're a bottom liner in here. Maybe you're just like, all right, give me a bottom line. You already, you already said, get, am I, what am I supposed to give? That's a part of the problem because in the end, it's not about 10%. It's not about that. It, it, it's not about just giving this little bit. You know, and I, I think you could be given 10% at church and still be wicked. This isn't about a tithe. The issue is God's after your heart. It's not about money. It, I don't want your money. Keep it in your wallet. The issue is God's after your heart, not how much you give. What's the state of your heart? What, what's actually going on that, in that spirit inside of you? When you give, are you reluctant? Do you just, eh, you know. When you're, when you're generous, when you're helping people, are you reluctant with that? Do you not help at all? Do you give because you think you're compelled to, right? Maybe you just think you have to. Saying what you believe and, and doing it is hard to discern here, right? I mean, you, you know that in, better than I do. Almost everybody you work with says they go to church somewhere, right? If you work, do they say they go to church? No. <laughs> they used to, though. Everybody I work with says they go to church, right? They don't live a life like that, right? But you see, you see what we actually, or maybe you got friends that you live with. I don't know your neighborhood or wherever you're at. I don't know. But but how do we know what we actually believe or how we actually what's going on in your heart? If we if we could step outside of this church this morning, that's where we have to get to the bottom line. And listen, that's not bad news. If you find out you're a liar, at least you know the truth. Do you understand the grace of God? Do you see yourself as an owner or a steward? And do you have a, a, a life that's rich? So here's the easy way, right? Using money like I have been. Open up your checkbook. What does your statement say? What does it look like? Is there any evidence in there that you do believe the way that you give? And you know, I'm not talking about ties to Apex. I'm not talking about giving to Apex. You know, we collect, this is what happens at Apex. We collect enough money every month to pay for this building. That's it. We, bear, we at one time, were going to start giving to, to missionaries. And, and when we did that, two weeks later, we were out of money. And at one time, we, you know, we thought we would do some other things. And then a month later, we didn't have enough money to, to barely pay the rent. But God provides. At one time when we were at the old church, we were $18,000 behind. And through little bits, little bits, little bits, little bits, we caught up, paid it off, got ahead, actually got ahead there. 
And then God shut them off and said, not to collect rent anymore from us. And then we moved here. But the utilities were more over there than this building cost. That's how God has blessed us. That's how you give. So what does your checkbook or your statement? And, the, and, and I'm not talking about your tithes. And, and, and I'm going to be honest with you. This is just, I think you should give to your church before you give to anything else, if you're going to give. And should you tithe? Yes. Should you tithe 10%? That's up to you. God owns everything. I'm not going to tell you that. But your balance can tell you if you're a liar. I mean, grace is a foundation of this thing, but some of us in here are saying that, you know, you'd love to be generous, but, you know, you've really made some foolish decisions, right? Maybe you say, well, I just made, you know, Jeff, I get it. I get it. I want to be bold, but about five years ago, my husband and I, we were at, we were at uh, Costco, and we bought a gold-plated jet plane, right? And we needed this jet plane, and we, it just looked so pretty and gold, and had, you know, we put, you know, Cox Airlines on the side, and, and it looks nice. You know, and with the way that the fuel prices are now, it's hard to get along with it. And, you know, just went from milk and we ended up with a plane, a jet. We want to be generous, but we're in a tight spot. Okay, I get that. That's different. But just don't go, here's my 10%, leave me alone. You give what you're capable of. I mean, the tie's never designated to be Here's what you get, and here's what I get. That's not what God's saying. Tithe is a symbol. It's not a symbolic gesture of it's all yours. See? Should we tithe this amount? And my response is, no, you should be given far more than that. I'm talking about only given to the church. I'm not talking about that. You know, maybe generous for you, and you've got to think about this, is just $7 a month. And then God's okay with that. Everything is his. That's where it gets complicated. You know, maybe you married an idiot woman, she left you with 12 kids and an apartment with one bedroom and you're just trying to survive. I get it. Maybe generosity in that case is just a couple dollars. You never know. I don't know. But you, you still have time, right? You still have things that, I mean, this church needs cleaned every week. Every week. That's something. Maybe you're not able to do that because you're hurt. I don't know. You know, I could say that some people have cleaned this church forever since we came in here. They need help. You know, it's, we like to hide under a level of silliness you know, or this is some parents, right? I want to give everything to my kid. I want to give everything to my grandkid. I want them to have more opportunities. I contend with you that your grandkid needs fewer, or your kid or grandkid needs fewer opportunities. Right? I mean, well, I want to give them everything. Have you ever been around the kid that's got everything? Right? Nobody likes your kid, bro. They don't like them. They don't like that kid. Just trying to unpack, trying to, you know, to teach and to try your children or your grandchildren radical generosity, to teach that to them, it takes discipline and work. And it's hard work because of the way things are today, right? I mean, because everything screams to them that they are God, little g, just like those pastors up there tell you that, they're, that you are God. That's a blasphemous lie. Not all of them, but a lot of them especially if they're in the NRA. May the Holy Spirit transform our hearts and minds. May we stop being the slaves to stuff. Everything, and I've said this before, everything that you own, every TV, couch, car, chair, you name it, is just for... <laughs> Just for Diane to collect at a yard sale in the future or it's going into a landfill. She knows it. <coughs> True story. She's just waiting on you to buy it. 
she's got a partner in crime, but I'm not allowed to mention Teresa's name, so. You just woke her up. I know. But everything you have is for future garage sales in landfills. Everything you own. Maybe it would be marked with generosity. Maybe, may the hurts and pains of others be, be met. May the hurts and pains that, that people in this church have. There's, there's women and, and men in this church that need help for Christmas this year. Or they don't even have food sometimes. It's a rough month. I get it. And may, the, may we give glory to God in the heavens because he's lavished his grace after grace after grace after grace 